Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Forsake the assembly of God's people together. Uh, Hebrews tells us that that is not how we are to live our Christian life. Say, well, I don't need free church, church three times a week. Well, you're much more spiritual than I am. You say, well, you're only here because you're a preacher. No. I'm not. If I was a preacher, I would still be at church on Sunday morning, Sunday evenings, and Wednesday night, or Thursday night if it was a church that held church on Thursday. You want strength? You'll find it on Wednesday nights and you'll find it on Sundays. Being a Christian doesn't mean just having a good heart. When you're in the battle, you need church as much as possible. You say, well, I can serve God on my own. Good luck. You won't be in a complete plan of God, whatever that plan is for him or for you. You will not fulfill it. You might fulfill it partially, but I'm not a man that's happy with partial. If I'm going to fulfill the plan of God in my life, I want to fulfill it 100%. So tonight, rather than going into Revelation, we're going to be covering the second part of this message. Um, otherwise, we'd be here till uh, 12 o'clock today. Um, so I'm going to split this message into two equal parts. And uh, it's important. We've heard Bible stories about this man, Daniel. Uh, we've, we've learned about him as children. But Daniel has something in his life that worked. Something that Christians today need. For those who are not familiar with the book of Daniel, I would challenge you to get familiar with it. In the announcements and the brochure that we handed out, You'll notice there was a title in this message, and it's exactly what this message is about. It's entitled, The Choice is Yours, Pray or Panic. Personally, I want to live through my life praying, not panicking. But the way this world is these days, it's very easy to fall into the state of panic. Uh, whether it be politics, whether it be pushy governors, whether it be uh, pushy work people, whether it be bosses, whether it be preachers. Whether it be other Christians, it's very, very important that we know how to make the right choice. So the Bible says this, for those that can stand, if you could please stand, and if you're um, sore or can't, that's fine. Uh, don't worry about it, I don't want you to be more out just through the reading of the text. The Bible says this in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they should find none occasion nor fault. For much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault in, found in him. Boy, if only the world could define that now. It's no fault in my life. What a good day that would be. What a good testimony that would be. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together, to the king, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. 
All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm degree that whosoever shall ask the petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he knelt, kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, as we, uh, Lord, delve into your word this morning and read about this man Daniel, this faithful man. Uh, God, a man that was mentioned, uh, Lord, in the book of faith. A man that has continually, um, continually lived a life that is conducive to you. He always lifted you up, and we thank you for that, God. He always trusted you, and we thank you for that, God. I pray that we can glean off of him today, and we can learn how to pray and not panic in these times that we're living in today. Lord, we give you all praise and glory for it. Just touch our hearts, touch your believer. Anybody here who doesn't know you, God, I pray that you touch them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned earlier, if you're not familiar with this book, get familiar with it. It's very important. It's not only important in being an example of how we should live and how we can have victory over uh, the things in this world that we're in today, but it is also a book of prophecy. Um, you want to understand some things about the end times? Get familiar with the book of Daniel. You want to understand the book of Revelation? Get familiar with the book of Daniel. You want to understand the book of Matthew in chapters 23, 24, 25? Get familiar with the book of Daniel because he prophesied about it. He talked about it, and then God said, see the book. Revelation, the, the Apostle John opened the book. God gave him the book to open to us. Daniel was told to seal the book. Now, as I'm challenging you today to get familiar with it, I want you back here tonight. I mentioned that earlier. Please come back tonight. Get a taste of what Sunday night's about. If you're not in here on Sunday nights and Wednesdays, I'm telling you, um, I, I don't get upset. I don't get mad. You're missing the blessing. It makes me sad. Sunday nights and Wednesdays are some of the greatest days for the church because you learn things. You learn how to take what's preached on Sunday. You learn how to take what you hear on Sunday morning, and then you apply it. You know, what good does it do to have a car if you don't know how to drive it, right? Well, there's a lot of driverless Christians out there today. They've got the Christian car. They've got the body. They've got the saved soul, but they don't know how to operate that thing. This Bible, God uses Sunday nights and Wednesday nights as a means of that uh, uh, the thing that we tend to throw away when we put something together. He gives us those days for those directions. And, uh, please come. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. I've read this book so many times, studied it, always seemed to enjoy it just as much as what I did the time before. It stirred my heart over and over again. It's made me curious over and over again. And it strengthened my faith over and over again. And it always seems to go back to this one character by the name of Daniel. You're missing out if you leave this great book of the prophet Daniel out. Now the devil has long determined to destroy this portion of the word of God. Uh, he wants to destroy the whole book, but he's, he's taken some special efforts to destroy this book. Um, and, and he's got a lot of people that have fell to his trap. Now, um, it's been attacked by liberals. It's been attacked by modernists. It's been attacked by science people. It's been attacked by scholars, Bible scholars. It's even been attacked by the church. Some of higher learning have even declared that it should not even be in the scriptures at all. They claim this is just an allegory, and there's no historical proof that this book ever even happened. As a matter of fact, in history, when you look at the kings over the Medes and the Pers Persians, you find out that Darius isn't in the history books. They've taken him out of the history books. It skips from Belshazzar to another king. completely skips Darius. Now, for some reason, I'm just fool enough to believe that the book God put in my hand is true. I'm just naive enough to believe that every period, every comma, every dot, every letter is meant to be in there for me. Call me old-fashioned, but the Word of God is the only absolute in our lives today. Times change. 
Seasons change, people change, trends change. Me and my wife were talking about this the other day. And, uh, we, we went, we were walking in the mall, and I, you know, I love going to the mall. I don't go there very often, but I can spend all day there looking at people. And, um, and I, I made this statement about what's coming back that used to be in my childhood. And if you notice, what, 15, 20 years ago, what was the hairstyle in the 50s? Short hair, what? Short hair. What happened in the, in the 60s and the 70s? Long, stringy hair came into play. What happened in the 80s? That's my years. The big hair came into play. Parachute pants and all that stuff. And, and um, Then in the 90s, the grunge look came in. Um, everybody wanted to be kind of grungy looking. And then in 2000, goth came in. And kids are starting to blacken their faces and and, uh, you know, they don't have no concerns with care of the world and, and all that stuff. But what's interesting, if you look at history, trends are on a cycle. And they repeat themselves. The last 10, 15 years, short hair in Randall's back. You know, you look at Roger's hair. Roger, now I'm, I'm not going to pick one. I like your hair. But let me ask you, how long do you wear your hair that way? 58. He doesn't follow the trends. I can't follow the trends of my hair. The only time I'm in the right trend is when Paul came in. Paul came in about 10 years ago. You know? It's because of all those people in the 80s that had the big hair realized that caused hair loss. And we had no choice but to set a trend to evolve. So we, we, we became bald. Trends change. There's no absolute. And what's coming back now, I'm starting to notice, is that 80s look. I'm starting to see these guys that are starting to wear the tiger jeans and the stretch jeans, and they're starting to let their hair grow out long. I'm watching those girls, and their, their dresses are starting to, to start to rise up a little bit. And I'm thinking, you know what? The 80s are coming back, and that is a sad note for America. There's a picture of me back when I was a teenager, and, and, uh, I'm not, and what I had on was a pair of tennis shoes that were high-top tennis shoes, and I had a pair of white socks. Pulled all the way up to my kneecaps, and it had three stripes. Remember, it, anybody in the 50s remember that? Remember the white socks with the big stripes on them? And I had them on, and I had a pair of cut-off blue jeans that weren't really loose-fitting. And I had a shirt on that was cut off right here, and it had this black panda on it, some Japanese writing on it. And I had this long, blonde hair, big old sunglasses on. And the picture is me walking I look like Sasquatch. I look like Sasquatch. But you know what trends come? Trends go. The Word of God is established for it. The Word of God is God's promise to mankind fulfilled that He will give us an absolute God that not only gets us to salvation, not only gets us to eternal security, but also gets us to heaven. And it also makes a guide by which we can always go to when we need, need guidance from God. And we as Christians need to understand that. We get good advice from doctors. We get good advice from politicians sometimes. Uh, you can find a needle in a haystack. <laughs> but ultimately, this is the absolute guide. The only true word of God. The promise of Psalms chapter 12. Now concerning this particular chapter, I find it very interesting because this one of the chapters of Daniel, one of them is under great attack because of this king named Darius. So anytime Darius is mentioned in scriptures, the naysayers will say that's not even true history. And you know what? He did have a wife by the name of the chief. So, so anyway, um, some of are going to try to get rid of this book. I believe this book. I believe it's supposed to be in there. And I believe that because in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus quotes it. He talks about this prophet by the name of Daniel. He says, when ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And what he's talking about there, the abomination of desolation, he's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble in the book of Revelation. It's supposed to be in here. And since Daniel was recognized by Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior himself, I'm going to recognize that it's supposed to be in this book too. And because of that, as God's people, we better all recognize it as true. That's supposed to be in there. Now, this particular time in Jewish history, um, God's children were taken captive by uh, Babylon. Uh, Daniel, um, through his testimony and through his honesty and through his God, found favor with King Darius. Darius came in to rule after Belshazzar when Babylon falls to the Persians under Cyrus. So these Babylonian people um, fell under Cyrus. Now Darius saw this man Daniel. He saw his testimony. He realized that this man Daniel has something to offer the kingdom. And he placed him above the presidents and above the princes. And the Bible tells you why in verse 3 of our text. The Bible says this in verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes. Why? The Bible says because an excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. If only our leaders in America had that same spirit. Right? If only they wanted good for God's people. If only they wanted good for mankind. If only they wanted everybody that they come in contact with to walk away encouraged knowing that there's help on the way. That's how Daniel was. When Daniel met people, they walked away encouraged. When Daniel met people, they walked away with a, a new sense of what faith is all about. A new sense of what the one true God can really be in their lives. Now, because of this excellent spirit, and because of Darius putting um, Daniel in a position, it shows me what Proverbs 16 says. When a man's ways please the Lord, you want, you want to move forward in life as a Christian? Walk in ways that please God. You want to live a good, peaceful Christian life? Walk in the ways that please your God. Do what God asks you to do. And the Bible will say, it says, when you do that, the Bible says that he will make even your enemies at peace with you. How many enemies do we have in our daily life that are not at peace with us? But the Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, because of Daniel's excellent spirit, because of Daniel finding favor in Darius' eyes, because of Darius moving Daniel up the ladder, the political ladder, and putting him in a position that had a lot of benefits with it, by the way, that made some people jealous. And because of that jealousy, they sought to find occasion. Look at verse 4. These other presidents, these princes, they were jealous, and through this jealousy uh, they had toward this Daniel, uh, towards this man of God. The Bible says in chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and princes sought, the Bible says, to find occasion against Daniel. Catch that? They conspired. There was a conspiracy, a real conspiracy. For anybody out there that likes conspiracies, whether they be theories or whether they be proven, read the book of Daniel. It's all over Daniel. It's all over this Bible. There is constantly men coming against God's men and creating conspiracies against them. Finding ways to make them guilty. Finding ways to find make them look like they're at fault with some of the leaders. To find ways to cause them to be put to death. It's been happening from day one. From day one. As a matter of fact, the devil's first temptation that he gave Adam and Eve, it was a conspiracy. Isn't that what, what the devil said? Didn't he say, God doesn't know that the, that the day that, that, that you eat thereof, uh, that, that your eyes will be open. In other words, if you eat this, you're going to see through God's plan. You're going to see what God's really doing. Right now, he's got a black veil in front of you, and he's doing things behind the scenes. 
But if you just eat of this fruit, your eyes should be open. Right off the bat, the devil was accusing God of conspiracy, a righteous God. And because of that, sin passed upon all men. Wherefore, it's by one man's sin, and therefore death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. And they quote that exactly right. It's over there in Romans chapter 5. Read that. It's a good chapter. But it says they sought to find occasion against, against him. And what amazes me is in all the, this all this consulting, all this meeting, all this privacy, the Bible says in verse 4, but they could find none occasion nor fault. And it tells you why. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault in him. This brings us to this man Daniel and the fact that he was above reproach. There was no way that the princes and the presidents were going to be able to find fault against this man Daniel. No way. He did everything right. And because of that, they consulted more and they came up with a plan. In verse 5 it says, Then said these men, When we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They tried every way they could to find fault with Daniel, but they found none. They did everything they could to find something that he was guilty of, but they found none. They wanted to report to this man Darius, to this king, that Daniel had broke some law. And because of that law, Darius would have to punish Daniel. And at that moment, they thought if they could get successful with this, maybe all they would do is put Daniel out of the way. But then they realized the only way they're going to be successful is to get Daniel killed. So that's what they did. They conspired. They wanted to report something bad about Darius, about Daniel to Darius. The problem was Daniel had been a faithful servant of King Darius. The problem is that these men, these presidents, princes, couldn't just go up to Darius and lie about Daniel because Darius knew the character of Daniel. And Darius knew that uh, Daniel had an excellent spirit. So there was no way if they said something it would be true. You ever have that in your life? Is your testimony as such that if somebody accused you of something, people that knew you would know you didn't do it? I was, when I worked over at Eaton Auto Products, I was having this conversation with this lady. And I said something that she didn't like. It was true. It wasn't being mean or anything. Just she didn't agree with it. The next day I go into work and someone, a lady comes up to me and she says, she told me you cussed at her. I went, what? She goes, yeah, she told me you cussed. You said blah, 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 blah. And I said, I never said that. And, and she goes, I know you did. I've never heard you cuss in all 20 years I've been here. I said, yeah. So I, I know exactly what I said to her. So what I did, I walked up to this lady that accused me. She wasn't being mean or anything. She just made a statement that I said something. And it's what she heard, not what I said. And uh, so I said, what did I say to you yesterday? And she said it. And I said, I didn't cuss. Because if I did, I, you know, I didn't get right about that. She goes, well, you didn't cuss. And the other lady looks at me and says, I didn't think you did. And I said, no, here's what I said. And I repeated it. And then the lady, the other lady accused me said, yeah, yeah, that's what you said. I said, I didn't cuss. Don't tell people I made I thought I was using profanity here. So I was. So this other woman knew, beyond a shadow of doubt, that what I was being accused of was not true. We ought to have that kind of testimony. That if somebody comes up and accuses you of something, and it ends up going to the court of law, that the law will say, I know them, I know their character, there's no way that could happen. And don't use that as a cloak of maliciousness. Really have that kind of character. That's the kind of character they have. They couldn't accuse him of nothing. They couldn't lie about him and say he did something because Darius knew that it would not be true. These rulers knew Daniel well. King Darius knew Daniel well. They watched Daniel honor God in the hardest times. They watched Daniel honor King Darius and not compromise on honoring his, his God. They watched Daniel rule righteously with an open heart and a right heart. They watched Daniel pray continually, morning, noon, and night. They saw his testimony. He was not the silent witness kind. They watched him set his heart to God every single day as he looked out that window and prayed to his God. They knew all about this man, Daniel. So they said, you know what? The only way that we're going to be able to get any victory over him, the only way we're going to 
get him accused of something is to make up a law that makes what he's legally doing illegal. Boy, didn't we face that in 2020? We see it all across America, California. Uh, one church there was doing nothing abnormal, what they always did. Battle Sunday, Battle Sunday nights, Battle Sunday, they did the beef thing, had readings through the week. All of a sudden, what they were doing, they've been doing for years, became illegal in the state of California. Did he change anything? Did he break any laws? No. But they, they signed a law, well, an ordinance, that made it illegal for him to do what he was doing. They signed a law, or an ordinance here in Ohio, Michael Warren said it out back in uh, uh, April or May. He said anybody that's having a meeting of more than 60 people cannot do it. You know what that did? That took us as cornerstone that would have more than 60 people on a Sunday morning. If we had 60 more people, 60 people show up, we were breaking the law. How about that? Were we doing anything unrighteous? We weren't, were we? That's why I kept the doors open. I wasn't going to compromise on that because God said, stay open. This is my law, you've got to go by, not my wine's law. That's the kind of testimony that Daniel had. So they had to make up some law that you would break because he was a man of character. So here's what they did. In chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says this. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. You know what they were doing? They were flattering him. You know what that means? Uh, say, you're a, say you're a cop. Say you're a police officer. And I got this guy over here. I want you to arrest, but he's not done anything wrong. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come up to you and say, man, I appreciate your service. You shake your hand. I'm going to start talking to you, and I'm going to say, man, you're a good guy. Is that guy over there? You know what he's doing? And instantly, what that will do to you, and what it does to most people, they think, oh my goodness, this guy really likes me, so he surely wouldn't be trying to lead me this great way. And that's exactly what those princes and those, those, those presidents did. They went to this king, and they said, oh king, oh thou that lives forever. They're flattering him. They're trying to butter him up, because they know they're getting ready to do something crooked. And they don't want him to turn him, turn him down. Said, so, oh, King Darius, live forever. Verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal staff. You know what that is? That's good old-fashioned marketing. You know, I've met with some of the greatest leaders. I've met with, I've met with some of the greatest Bible scholars. And they're, they're all in agreement that, Dave, that book you're carrying is a they're all in agreement that, that there can't be only one way to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, the majority of them are in agreement that there isn't even a real hell. Noah's flood didn't really happen. It's out of the world. Darius never really existed. All the Bible scholars have consulted together, and this is what we came up with. Don't believe that junk. Don't believe the Bible scholars. Don't believe those that gather together and consult. You know why? Because they are having a direct assault, a direct attack, a direct uh, goal of getting rid of this book that we carry in our hand. Because if they take our final authority away, if they take the absolute truth away, they can bring in any kind of lie they want. And they're doing it. They're doing it. There's not a whole lot of churches out there that believe that God kept his promise of Psalms chapter 12 to give us an inspired, pure, perfect. By the grace of God, I will always stand on this book. And by the grace of God, I will always believe this as the ultimate authority in my life. There is no other. There is no, no other that takes its place. There is not one that's better than the other. This one isn't just the best translation. This one isn't just the closest to the truth of God. It is the final authority of truth and nothing in it. There is no errors in it. Okay, what the Bible scholars say, what the educated say. I'd love to sit down with some of these cats and just ask them flat out what they think about Jesus Christ. And they'll tell you. A lot of them do. They don't believe he's God. Marketing. When you market something enough, people are going to fall for it. And to make a firm decree, it says in verse 7, that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth it not. 
They knew that as soon as the king signed this decree, it was law. And according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, once a decree is signed, it must stand. It could not be altered. The king could not say, I'm the king and I'm going against it. He had to fulfill it. Absolutely had to. Talk about snakes and politicians. Although they're all the same. Snakes and politicians, I don't see much difference in them. The devil himself started as a politician in the Garden of Eden. Trying to twist things around to his own little stay on things. But what they end up doing, they accomplish their goal. And turn an otherwise law keeper of God into a law breaker of man's law. And this brings us to Daniel and the choice that he made. And it's this time. This same time uh, that we as Christians need to understand that the same choice Daniel made, it wasn't by accident. It wasn't something that um, he just did. God prepared him for it, just like he's preparing you for it. He's giving you the tools you need, giving you the opportunity you need to strengthen your faith. And he's giving you the choice to pray or panic during these times. Am I going to pray or am I going to pray? Ask yourselves that question. I pray, God, that we can all say, I want to pray in my hand. But how do we do that? I mean, let's look at what's going on in the world today. You've got governors and, and, and uh, uh, senators and, and a, a congressman and congressmen and all over this country signing these degrees, signing these laws that make what we otherwise do as legal illegal. That's what they're doing. You say, what's this age you live in? It's been that way for eons. It's nothing new. We read about it here in Daniel 6. They took something righteous and didn't like it. You realize you live a righteous life and the world won't like you. So the Bible says, you say, well, I can, I can be at peace with all you can. The Bible says, when it's all possible, be at peace with all men. We should be. But there's times when you just got to turn into a lawbreaker. Not God's law, man's law. Unrighteous laws. You know how many preachers shut down with this comment? And then this is what they said. Well, the ordinance is out there, so I must follow the law of the congressman. I must follow the decree that he put out. I must follow what the one said. Because the Bible tells me I need to be in submission to the ordinances of man. You do. But not only directly, con or God contradicts the word of God. When the state starts saying, you can't come to church, come to church. When the state starts saying, you can't pray in public, walk right out of the town square and bow down with your Bible and start praying. When the state says, you can't proclaim Jesus Christ, stand out on the street corner and get up on your rooftop and proclaim Jesus Christ. When the state tells you that you can't do this and do that, and God tells you exactly the opposite, that you should do it, do what God says. But how? It's fear. It, it puts fear in you, doesn't it? It scares me. It does. So how do I do that? You're going to find out tonight. I told you, you've got to come back tonight for the rest of this message. And you want an answer of how to pray and not panic when the world's against you. How to pray and not panic when COVID's not going to your front door. How to pray and not panic when states all across America are making up these ungodly laws and forcing you to comply. You want to know how to stand by your window, point your face towards Jerusalem, and pray unto the Holy God no matter what? Come back tonight. You'll get the message. I'm challenging everyone here tonight. Go home. Rest. If you've got a busy day, day to day, take some time and rest before 7 o'clock and show up tonight. I'll give you the answers. There are six points that we're going to go over tonight of how Daniel managed to go ahead and obey God and disobey an unlawful king's degree and what happened to him afterwards. And we all know the story, the children's story, that gets cast into the den of lions, and the lion, God shut the lion's mouth, and he walked out of there. We all know that story. But how? Do you think God would have done that if Daniel wasn't already faithful? you think God would have done that if Daniel didn't already have the character of a good man? you think God would have done that if Daniel didn't already set his face towards Jerusalem before that had been happening in his life? I'm not sure God would. He said, well, God will take care of you. Yeah, he will. But you know, God will take you out sometimes, too. He absolutely will. 
And you know who he's going to pay attention to? He's going to pay attention to the faithful. He's going to pay attention to the people with courage. He's going to pay attention to the people that have said in their heart they're going to be God rather than man. He's going to pay attention to those people that have said in their heart, their mind, their soul, they're going to stand for God no matter what the state says. You want a strong church? You want a good home? You want a good Christian heart? Come back tonight and you'll get those six answers. And they're simple. Very simple. But you know where it all starts? We're going to close it right there. But I'm going to make this statement. You know where it starts? The same place it is. It is. Right here. On his knees. Praying. Seeking his God as he always did before time. You want the strength? You want the courage? You want the faith? You want those things? you got to get out on your knees, folks. <laughs> The way up is to get down. The way to glory is to humble yourself before a holy God. The way to salvation is to give everything you got to Jesus Christ. You want courage through COVID? You want courage and strength through the troubles in your life? Start at the altar on your knees. Salvation is where it starts, and that starts with you on your knees and humble yourself. We all stand this battle and ice cross. This battle and ice cross. Let me ask you this, sir. Um, everybody in this room today, I challenge you, I want you to go home, and I want you to take some time, and I want you to read Daniel chapter 6, from start to finish. And then come back tonight. And it'll make a lot of sense to you. But if you're in here today, and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, it can be very what do I do? Do I go by what man says? Do I go by what, what uh, the job says? Do I go by what my heart says? No. You go by what Jesus Christ says. But you can't hear him until you, you answer the call of salvation. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Can anybody out there today raise their hand and say, you know what, preacher? I don't know about Jesus Christ. I don't have that peace of eternity of knowing where I'm going to stay when I die. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Anybody at all, you can raise your hands. Anybody at all? How about you, Christian? Can you raise your hand and say, you know what, Christian? I want a better walk with God. I want a closer walk with Him. I know what I am, and I know what God wants me to be, and I'm struggling. And man, hands all over the room. Come up here this morning. Just say, God, help me. I don't have the answers, but I know what I do. God, give me strength with me. Show me my next step. Show me what your plan is, and show me how to do that. And He will. I serve God that's faithful. I serve God that's faithful and God's here as far as me when I'm growing up. He wants me to come in. What a great father we serve, amen. And that's what fathers do. They listen to their children. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And there you go. Continue to play the altars. Your little God is the song. So I'm ready to play the song. God, I believe.